Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The District Doctor by Ivan S. Turgenev One day in autumn on my way back from a remote part of the country I caught cold and fell ill. Fortunately the fever attacked me in the district town at the inn, I sent for the doctor. In half an hour the district doctor appeared, a thin, dark-haired man of middle height. He prescribed me the usual sudorific, ordered a mustard plaster to be put on, very deftly slid a five-ruble note up his sleeve, coughing drilly and looking away as he did so, and then was getting up to go home, but somehow fell into talk and remained. I was exhausted with feverishness, I foresaw a sleepless night, and was glad of a little chat with a pleasant companion. Tea was served. My doctor began to converse freely. He was a sensible fellow, and expressed himself with vigor and some humor. Queer things happen in the world, you may live a long while with some people, and be on friendly terms with them, and never once speak openly with them from your soul, with others you have scarcely time to get acquainted, and all at once you are pouring out to him or he to you all your secrets, as though you were at confession. I don't know how I gained the confidence of my new friend anyway, with nothing to lead up to it, he told me a rather curious incident, and here I will report his tale for the information of the indulgent reader. I will try to tell it in the doctor's own words. You don't happen to know, he began in a weak and quavering voice, the common result of the use of unmixed Berezov snuff, you don't happen to know the judge here, my love, Pavel Lukic? You don't know him? Well, it's all the same. He cleared his throat and rubbed his eyes. Well, you see, the thing happened, to tell you exactly without mistake, in Lent, at the very time of the thaws. I was sitting at his house our judges, you know playing preference. Our judge is a good fellow, and fond of playing preference. Suddenly, the doctor made frequent use of this word, suddenly, they tell me, there's a servant asking for you. I say, what does he want? They say, he has brought a note it must be from a patient. Give me the note, I say. So it is from a patient well and good you understand it's our bread and butter. But this is how it was, a lady, a widow, writes to me, she says, my daughter is dying. Come, for God's sake, she says, and the horses have been sent for you. Well, that's all right. But she was twenty miles from the town, and it was midnight out of doors, and the roads in such a state, my word. And as she was poor herself, one could not expect more than two silver rubles, and even that problematic, and perhaps it might only be a matter of a roll of linen and a sack of oatmeal in underscore payment underscore. However, duty, you know, before everything, a fellow creature may be dying. I hand over my cards at once to Kaliapin, the member of the provincial commission, and return home. I look, a wretched little trap was standing at the steps, with peasants' horses, fat too fat and their coat as shaggy as felt, and the coachman sitting with his cap off out of respect. Well, I think to myself, it's clear, my friend, these patients aren't rolling in riches. You smile, but I tell you, a poor man like me has to take everything into consideration. If the coachman sits like a prince, and doesn't touch his cap, and even sneers at you behind his beard, and flicks his whip then you may bet on six rubles. But this case, I saw, had a very different air. However, I think there's no help for it, duty before everything. I snatch up the most necessary drugs, and set off. Will you believe it? I only just managed to get there at all. The road was infernal streams, snow, watercourses, and the dike had suddenly burst there that was the worst of it. However, I arrived at last. It was a little thatched house. There was a light in the windows, that meant they expected me. I was met by an old lady, very venerable, in a cap. Save her, she says, she is dying. I say, pray don't distress yourself where is the invalid? Come this way. 
I see a clean little room, a lamp in the corner, on the bed a girl of twenty, unconscious. She was in a burning heat, and breathing heavily it was fever. There were two other girls, her sisters, scared and in tears. Yesterday, they tell me, she was perfectly well and had a good appetite, this morning she complained of her head, and this evening, suddenly, you see, like this. I say again, pray don't be uneasy. It's a doctor's duty, you know and I went up to her and bled her, told them to put on a mustard plaster, and prescribed a mixture. Meantime I looked at her, I looked at her, you know there, by God. I had never seen such a face, she was a beauty, in a word. I felt quite shaken with pity. Such lovely features, such eyes. But, thank God. She became easier, she fell into a perspiration, seemed to come to her senses, looked round, smiled, and passed her hand over her face. Her sisters bent over her. They ask, how are you? All right, she says, and turns away. I looked at her, she had fallen asleep. Well, I say, now the patient should be left alone. So we all went out on tiptoe, only a maid remained, in case she was wanted. In the parlor there was a samovar standing on the table, and a bottle of rum, in our profession one can't get on without it. They gave me tea, asked me to stop the night. I consented, where could I go, indeed, at that time of night? The old lady kept groaning. What is it? I say, she will live, don't worry yourself, you had better take a little rest yourself, it is about two o'clock. But will you send to wake me if anything happens? Yes, yes. The old lady went away, and the girls too went to their own room, they made up a bed for me in the parlor. Well, I went to bed but I could not get to sleep, for a wonder. For in reality I was very tired. I could not get my patient out of my head. At last I could not put up with it any longer, I got up suddenly, I think to myself, I will go and see how the patient is getting on. Her bedroom was next to the parlor. Well, I got up, and gently opened the door how my heart beat. I looked in, the servant was asleep, her mouth wide open, and even snoring, the wretch. But the patient lay with her face towards me and her arms flung wide apart, poor girl. I went up to her, when suddenly she opened her eyes and stared at me. Who is it? Who is it? I was in confusion. Don't be alarmed, madam, I say, I am the doctor, I have come to see how you feel. You the doctor? Yes, the doctor, your mother sent for me from the town, we have bled you, madam, now pray go to sleep, and in a day or two, please God. We will set you on your feet again. Ah, uh, yes, yes, doctor, don't let me die, please, please. Why do you talk like that? God bless you. She is in a fever again, I think to myself, I felt her pulse, yes, she was feverish. She looked at me, and then took me by the hand. I will tell you why I don't want to die, I will tell you. Now we are alone, and only, please don't you, not to anyone. Listen. I bent down, she moved her lips quite to my ear, she touched my cheek with her hair I confess my head went round and began to whisper. I could make out nothing of it. Ah, she was delirious. She whispered and whispered, but so quickly, and as if it were not in Russian, at last she finished, and shivering dropped her head on the pillow, and threatened me with her finger, remember, doctor, to no one. I calmed her somehow, gave her something to drink, waked the servant, and went away. At this point the doctor again took snuff with exasperated energy, and for a moment seemed stupefied by its effects. However, he continued, the next day, contrary to my expectations, the patient was no better. I thought and thought, and suddenly decided to remain there, even though my other patients were expecting me. And you know one can't afford to disregard that, one's practice suffers if one does. But, in the first place, the patient was really in danger, and secondly, to tell the truth, I felt strongly drawn to her. 
Besides, I liked the whole family. Though they were really badly off, they were singularly, I may say, cultivated people. Their father had been a learned man, an author, he died, of course, in poverty, but he had managed before he died to give his children an excellent education, he left a lot of books too. Either because I looked after the invalid very carefully, or for some other reason, anyway, I can venture to say all the household loved me as if I were one of the family. Meantime the roads were in a worse state than ever, all communications, so to say, were cut off completely, even medicine could with difficulty be got from the town. The sick girl was not getting better. Day after day, and day after day, but, here. The doctor made a brief pause. I declare I don't know how to tell you. He again took snuff, coughed, and swallowed a little tea. I will tell you without beating about the bush. My patient, how should I say? Well she had fallen in love with me, or, no, it was not that she was in love, however, really, how should one say? The doctor looked down and grew red. No, he went on quickly, in love, indeed. A man should not overestimate himself. She was an educated girl, clever and well-read, and I had even forgotten my Latin, one may say, completely. As to appearance, the doctor looked himself over with a smile, I am nothing to boast of there either. But God Almighty did not make me a fool, I don't take black for white, I know a thing or two, I could see very clearly, for instance that Alexandra Andreevna that was her name did not feel love for me, but had a friendly, so to say, inclination a respect or something for me. Though she herself perhaps mistook this sentiment, anyway this was her attitude, you may form your own judgment of it. But, added the doctor, who had brought out all these disconnected sentences without taking breath, and with obvious embarrassment, I seem to be wandering rather you won't understand anything like this. There, with your leave, I will relate it all in order. He drank off a glass of tea, and began in a calmer voice. Well, then. My patient kept getting worse and worse. You are not a doctor, my good sir. You cannot understand what passes in a poor fellow's heart, especially at first, when he begins to suspect that the disease is getting the upper hand of him. What becomes of his belief in himself? You suddenly grow so timid, it's indescribable. You fancy then that you have forgotten everything you knew, and that the patient has no faith in you, and that other people begin to notice how distracted you are, and tell you the symptoms with reluctance that they are looking at you suspiciously, whispering. Ah! It's horrid. There must be a remedy, you think, for this disease, if one could find it. Isn't this it? You try no, that's not it. You don't allow the medicine the necessary time to do good. You clutch at one thing, then at another. Sometimes you take up a book of medical prescriptions here it is, you think. Sometimes, by Jove, you pick one out by chance, thinking to leave it to fate. But meantime a fellow creature's dying, and another doctor would have saved him. We must have a consultation, you say, I will not take the responsibility on myself. And what a fool you look at such times. Well, in time you learn to bear it, it's nothing to you. A man has died but it's not your fault, you treated him by the rules. But what's still more torture to you is to see blind faith in you, and to feel yourself that you are not able to be of use. Well, it was just this blind faith that the whole of Alexandra Andreevna's family had in me, they had forgotten to think that their daughter was in danger. I, too, on my side assure them that it's nothing, but meantime my heart sinks into my boots. To add to our troubles, the roads were in such a state that the coachman was gone for whole days together to get medicine. And I never left the patient's room, I could not tear myself away, I tell her amusing stories, you know, and play cards with her. I watch by her side at night. The old mother thanks me with tears in her eyes, but I think to myself, I don't deserve your gratitude. I frankly confess to you there is no object in concealing it now I was in love with my patient. And Alexandra Andreevna had grown fond of me, 
she would not sometimes let anyone be in her room but me. She began to talk to me, to ask me questions, where I had studied, how I lived, who are my people, whom I go to see. I feel that she ought not to talk, but to forbid her to to forbid her resolutely, you know I could not. Sometimes I held my head in my hands, and asked myself, what are you doing, villain? And she would take my hand and hold it, give me a long, long look, and turn away, sigh, and say, how good you are. Her hands were so feverish, her eyes so large and languid. Yes, she says, you are a good, kind man, you are not like our neighbors. No, you are not like that. Why did I not know you till now? Alexandra Andreevna, calm yourself, I say. I feel, believe me, I don't know how I have gained, but there, calm yourself. All will be right, you will be well again. And meanwhile I must tell you, continued the doctor, bending forward and raising his eyebrows, that they associated very little with the neighbors, because the smaller people were not on their level, and pride hindered them from being friendly with the rich. I tell you, they were an exceptionally cultivated family, so you know it was gratifying for me. She would only take her medicine from my hands, she would lift herself up, poor girl, with my aid, take it, and gaze at me. My heart felt as if it were bursting. And meanwhile she was growing worse and worse, worse and worse, all the time, she will die, I think to myself, she must die. Believe me, I would sooner have gone to the grave myself, and here were her mother and sisters watching me, looking into my eyes, and their faith in me was wearing away. Well? How is she? Oh, all right, all right. All right, indeed. My mind was failing me. Well, I was sitting one night alone again by my patient. The maid was sitting there too, and snoring away in full swing. I can't find fault with the poor girl, though, she was worn out too. Alexandra Andreevna had felt very unwell all the evening, she was very feverish. Until midnight she kept tossing about, at last she seemed to fall asleep, at least, she lay still without stirring. The lamp was burning in the corner before the holy image. I sat there, you know, with my head bent, I even dozed a little. Suddenly it seemed as though someone touched me in the side, I turned round. Good God! Alexandra Andreevna was gazing with intent eyes at me, her lips parted, her cheeks seemed burning. What is it? Doctor, shall I die? Merciful heavens! No, doctor, no, please don't tell me I shall live, don't say so. If you knew. Listen. For God's sake don't conceal my real position, and her breath came so fast. If I can know for certain that I must die, then I will tell you all, all. Alexandra Andreevna, I beg. Listen, I have not been asleep at all. I have been looking at you a long while. For God's sake. I believe in you, you are a good man, an honest man, I entreat you by all that is sacred in the world tell me the truth. If you knew how important it is for me. Doctor, for God's sake tell me. Am I in danger? What can I tell you, Alexandra Andreevna, pray? For God's sake, I beseech you. I can't disguise from you, I say, Alexandra Andreevna, you are certainly in danger, but God is merciful. I shall die, I shall die. And it seemed as though she were pleased, her face grew so bright, I was alarmed. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. I am not frightened of death at all. She suddenly sat up and leaned on her elbow. Now, yes, now I can tell you that I thank you with my whole heart. That you are kind and good that I love you. I stare at her, like one possessed, it was terrible for me, you know. Do you hear, I love you? Alexandra Andreevna, how have I deserved, no, no, you don't you don't understand me. And suddenly she stretched out her arms, and taking my head in her hands, she kissed it. Believe me, I almost screamed aloud. I threw myself on my knees, and buried my head in the pillow. 
She did not speak, her fingers trembled in my hair, I listen, she is weeping. I began to soothe her, to assure her. I really don't know what I did say to her. You will wake up the girl, I say to her, Alexandra Andreevna, I thank you, believe me. Calm yourself. Enough, enough, she persisted, never mind all of them, let them wake, then, let them come in it does not matter, I am dying, you see. And what do you fear? Why are you afraid? Lift up your head. Or, perhaps, you don't love me, perhaps I am wrong. In that case, forgive me. Alexandra Andreevna, what are you saying? I love you, Alexandra Andreevna. She looked straight into my eyes, and opened her arms wide. Then take me in your arms. I tell you frankly, I don't know how it was I did not go mad that night. I feel that my patient is killing herself, I see that she is not fully herself, I understand, too, that if she did not consider herself on the point of death, she would never have thought of me, and, indeed, say what you will, it's hard to die at twenty without having known love, this was what was torturing her, this was why, in despair, she caught at me do you understand now? But she held me in her arms, and would not let me go. Have pity on me, Alexandra Andreevna, and have pity on yourself, I say. Why, she says, what is there to think of? You know I must die. This she repeated incessantly. If I knew that I should return to life, and be a proper young lady again, should be ashamed, of course, ashamed. But why now? But who has said you will die? Oh, no, leave off. You will not deceive me, you don't know how to lie look at your face. You shall live, Alexandra Andreevna, I will cure you, we will ask your mother's blessing, we will be united we will be happy. No, no, I have your word, I must die, you have promised me, you have told me. It was cruel for me cruel for many reasons. And see what trifling things can do sometimes, it seems nothing at all, but it's painful. It occurred to her to ask me, what is my name, not my surname, but my first name. I must needs be so unlucky as to be called Trifon. Yes, indeed, Trifon Ivanik. Everyone in the house called me doctor. However, there's no help for it. I say, Trifon, madam. She frowned, shook her head, and muttered something in French, uh, something unpleasant, of course, and then she laughed disagreeably too. Well, I spent the whole night with her in this way. Before morning I went away, feeling as though I were mad. When I went again into her room it was daytime, after morning tea. Good God! I could scarcely recognize her, people are laid in their grave looking better than that. I swear to you, on my honor. I don't understand I absolutely don't understand now, how I lived through that experience. Three days and nights my patient still lingered on. And what nights? What things she said to me? And on the last night only imagine to yourself I was sitting near her, and kept praying to God for one thing only, take her, I said, quickly, and me with her. Suddenly the old mother comes unexpectedly into the room. I had already the evening before told her the mother there was little hope, and it would be well to send for a priest. When the sick girl saw her mother she said, It's very well you have come, look at us, we love one another we have given each other our word. What does she say, doctor? What does she say? I turned livid. She underscore is underscore wandering, I say, the fever. But she, hush, hush you told me something quite different just now, and have taken my ring. Why do you pretend? My mother is good she will forgive she will understand and I am dying. I have no need to tell lies, give me your hand. I jumped up and ran out of the room. The old lady, of course, guessed how it was. I will not, however, weary you any longer, and to me too, of course, it's painful to recall all this. My patient passed away the next day. God rest her soul, the doctor added, speaking quickly and with a sigh. 
Before her death she asked her family to go out and leave me alone with her. Forgive me, she said, I am perhaps to blame towards you, my illness, but believe me, I have loved no one more than you, do not forget me, keep my ring. The doctor turned away, I took his hand. Ah, he said, let us talk of something else, or would you care to play preference for a small stake? It is not for people like me to give way to exalted emotions. There's only one thing for me to think of, how to keep the children from crying and the wife from scolding. Since then, you know, I have had time to enter into lawful wedlock, as they say. Oh. I took a merchant's daughter 7,000 for her dowry. Her name's Aculina, it goes well with Trifon. She is an ill-tempered woman, I must tell you, but luckily she's asleep all day. Well, shall it be preference? We sat down to preference for halfpenny points. Trifon Ivanik won two rubles and a half from me, and went home late, well pleased with his success. The Christmas Tree and the Wedding By Fyodor M. Dostoevsky The other day I saw a wedding. But no. I would rather tell you about a Christmas tree. The wedding was superb. I liked it immensely. But the other incident was still finer. I don't know why it is that the sight of the wedding reminded me of the Christmas tree. This is the way it happened, exactly five years ago, on New Year's Eve, I was invited to a children's ball by a man high up in the business world, who had his connections, his circle of acquaintances, and his intrigues. So it seemed as though the children's ball was merely a pretext for the parents to come together and discuss matters of interest to themselves, quite innocently and casually. I was an outsider, and, as I had no special matters to air, I was able to spend the evening independently of the others. There was another gentleman present who like myself had just stumbled upon this affair of domestic bliss. He was the first to attract my attention. His appearance was not that of a man of birth or high family. He was tall, rather thin, very serious, and well-dressed. Apparently he had no heart for the family festivities. The instant he went off into a corner by himself the smile disappeared from his face, and his thick dark brows knitted into a frown. He knew no one except the host and showed every sign of being bored to death, though bravely sustaining the role of thorough enjoyment to the end. Later I learned that he was a provincial, had come to the capital on some important, brain-racking business, had brought a letter of recommendation to our host, and our host had taken him under his protection, not at all underscore con amore underscore. It was merely out of politeness that he had invited him to the children's ball. They did not play cards with him, they did not offer him cigars. No one entered into conversation with him. Possibly they recognized the bird by its feathers from a distance. Thus, my gentleman, not knowing what to do with his hands, was compelled to spend the evening stroking his whiskers. His whiskers were really fine, but he stroked them so assiduously that one got the feeling that the whiskers had come into the world first and afterwards the man in order to stroke them. There was another guest who interested me. But he was of quite a different order. He was a personage. They called him Julian Mastakovich. At first glance one could tell he was an honored guest and stood in the same relation to the host as the host to the gentleman of the whiskers. The host and hostess said no end of amiable things to him, were most attentive, whining him, hovering over him, bringing guests up to be introduced, but never leading him to anyone else. I noticed tears glisten in our host's eyes when Julian Mastakovich remarked that he had rarely spent such a pleasant evening. Somehow I began to feel uncomfortable in this personage's presence. So, after amusing myself with the children, five of whom, remarkably well-fed young persons, were our hosts, I went into a little sitting room, entirely unoccupied, and seated myself at the end that was a conservatory and took up almost half the room. The children were charming. They absolutely refused to resemble their elders, notwithstanding the efforts of mothers and governesses.
In a jiffy they had denuded the Christmas tree down to the very last suite and had already succeeded in breaking half of their playthings before they even found out which belonged to whom. One of them was a particularly handsome little lad, dark-eyed, curly-haired, who stubbornly persisted in aiming at me with his wooden gun. But the child that attracted the greatest attention was his sister, a girl of about eleven, lovely as a cupid. She was quiet and thoughtful, with large, full, dreamy eyes. The children had somehow offended her, and she left them and walked into the same room that I had withdrawn into. There she seated herself with her doll in a corner. Her father is an immensely wealthy businessman, the guests informed each other in tones of awe. Three hundred thousand rubles set aside for her dowry already. As I turned to look at the group from which I heard this news item issuing, my glance met Julian Mastakovich's. He stood listening to the insipid chatter in an attitude of concentrated attention, with his hands behind his back and his head inclined to one side. All the while I was quite lost in admiration of the shrewdness our host displayed in the dispensing of the gifts. The little maid of the many ruby dowry received the handsomest doll, and the rest of the gifts were graded in value according to the diminishing scale of the parent stations in life. The last child, a tiny chap of ten, thin, red-haired, freckled, came into possession of a small book of nature stories without illustrations or even head and tail pieces. He was the governess's child. She was a poor widow, and her little boy, clad in a sorry-looking little nankeen jacket, looked thoroughly crushed and intimidated. He took the book of nature stories and circled slowly about the children's toys. He would have given anything to play with them. But he did not dare to. You could tell he already knew his place. I like to observe children. It is fascinating to watch the individuality in them struggling for self-assertion. I could see that the other children's things had tremendous charm for the red-haired boy, especially a toy theater, in which he was so anxious to take a part that he resolved to fawn upon the other children. He smiled and began to play with them. His one and only apple he handed over to a puffy urchin whose pockets were already crammed with sweets, and he even carried another youngster pickaback all simply that he might be allowed to stay with the theater. But in a few moments an impudent young person fell on him and gave him a pummeling. He did not dare even to cry. The governess came and told him to leave off interfering with the other children's games, and he crept away to the same room the little girl and I were in. She let him sit down beside her, and the two set themselves busily dressing the expensive doll. Almost half an hour passed, and I was nearly dozing off, as I sat there in the conservatory half listening to the chatter of the red-haired boy and the dowered beauty, when Julian Mastakovich entered suddenly. He had slipped out of the drawing room under cover of a noisy scene among the children. From my secluded corner it had not escaped my notice that a few moments before he had been eagerly conversing with the rich girl's father, to whom he had only just been introduced. He stood still for a while reflecting and mumbling to himself, as if counting something on his fingers. 300 311 12 13 16 in 5 years. Let's say 4 percent 5 times 12 60, and on these 60. Let us assume that in five years it will amount to well, four hundred. Hmm <laughs> hmm. But the shrewd old fox isn't likely to be satisfied with four percent. He gets eight or even ten, perhaps. Let's suppose five hundred, five hundred thousand, at least, that's sure. Anything above that for pocket money hmm, he blew his nose and was about to leave the room when he spied the girl and stood still. I, behind the plants, escaped his notice. He seemed to me to be quivering with excitement. It must have been his calculations that upset him so. He rubbed his hands and danced from place to place, and kept getting more and more excited. Finally, however, he conquered his emotions and came to a standstill. He cast a determined look at the future bride and wanted to move toward her, but glanced about first. Then, as if with a guilty conscience, he stepped over to the child on tiptoe, smiling, and bent down and kissed her head. His coming was so unexpected that she uttered a shriek of alarm. 
What are you doing here, dear child, he whispered, looking around and pinching her cheek. We're playing. What, with him, said Julian Mastakovich with a look askance at the governess's child. You should go into the drawing room, my lad, he said to him. The boy remained silent and looked up at the man with wide open eyes. Julian Mastakovich glanced round again cautiously and bent down over the girl. What have you got, a doll, my dear? Yes, sir. The child quailed a little, and her brow wrinkled. A doll? And do you know, my dear, what dolls are made of? No, sir, she said weakly, and lowered her head. Out of rags, my dear. You, boy, you go back to the drawing room, to the children, said Julian Mastakovich looking at the boy sternly. The two children frowned. They caught hold of each other and would not part. And do you know why they gave you the doll? asked Julian Mastakovich, dropping his voice lower and lower. No. Because you were a good, very good little girl the whole week. Saying which, Julian Mastakovich was seized with a paroxysm of agitation. He looked round and said in a tone faint, almost inaudible with excitement and impatience, if I come to visit your parents will you love me, my dear? He tried to kiss the sweet little creature, but the red-haired boy saw that she was on the verge of tears, and he caught her hand and sobbed out loud in sympathy. That enraged the man. Go away. Go away. Go back to the other room, to your playmates. I don't want him to. I don't want him to. You go away, cried the girl. Let him alone. Let him alone. She was almost weeping. There was a sound of footsteps in the doorway. Julian Mastakovich started and straightened up his respectable body. The red haired boy was even more alarmed. He let go the girl's hand, sidled along the wall, and escaped through the drawing room into the dining room. Not to attract attention, Julian Mastakovich also made for the dining room. He was red as a lobster. The sight of himself in a mirror seemed to embarrass him. Presumably he was annoyed at his own ardor and impatience. Without due respect to his importance and dignity, his calculations had lured and pricked him to the greedy eagerness of a boy, who makes straight for his object though this was not as yet an object, it only would be so in five years' time. I followed the worthy man into the dining room, where I witnessed a remarkable play. Julian Mastakovich, all flushed with vexation, venom in his look, began to threaten the red-haired boy. The red-haired boy retreated farther and farther until there was no place left for him to retreat to, and he did not know where to turn in his fright. Get out of here. What are you doing here? Get out, I say, you good for nothing. Stealing fruit, are you? Oh, so, stealing fruit. Get out, you freckle face, go to your likes. The frightened child, as a last desperate resort, crawled quickly under the table. His persecutor, completely infuriated, pulled out his large linen handkerchief and used it as a lash to drive the boy out of his position. Here I must remark that Julian Mastakovich was a somewhat corpulent man, heavy, well-fed, puffy-cheeked, with a paunch and ankles as round as nuts. He perspired and puffed and panted. So strong was his dislike, or was it jealousy, of the child that he actually began to carry on like a madman. I laughed heartily. Julian Mastakovich turned. He was utterly confused and for a moment, apparently, quite oblivious of his immense importance. At that moment our host appeared in the doorway opposite. The boy crawled out from under the table and wiped his knees and elbows. Julian Mastakovich hastened to carry his handkerchief, which he had been dangling by the corner, to his nose. Our host looked at the three of us rather suspiciously. But, like a man who knows the world and can readily adjust himself, he seized upon the opportunity to lay hold of his very valuable guest and get what he wanted out of him. Here's the boy I was talking to you about, he said, indicating the red-haired child. I took the liberty of presuming on your goodness in his behalf. 
Oh, replied Julian Mastakovich, still not quite master of himself. He's my governess's son, our host continued in a beseeching tone. She's a poor creature, the widow of an honest official. That's why, if it were possible for you, impossible, impossible. Julian Mastakovich cried hastily. You must excuse me, Philip Alexeyevich, I really cannot. I've made inquiries. There are no vacancies, and there is a waiting list of ten who have a greater right I'm sorry. Too bad, said our host. He's a quiet, unobtrusive child. A very naughty little rascal, I should say, said Julian Mastakovich, wryly. Go away, boy. Why are you here still? Be off with you to the other children. Unable to control himself, he gave me a sidelong glance. Nor could I control myself. I laughed straight in his face. He turned away and asked our host, in tones quite audible to me, who that odd young fellow was. They whispered to each other and left the room, disregarding me. I shook with laughter. Then I, too, went to the drawing room. There the great man, already surrounded by the fathers and mothers and the host and the hostess, had begun to talk eagerly with a lady to whom he had just been introduced. The lady held the rich little girl's hand. Julian Mastakovich went into fulsome praise of her. He waxed ecstatic over the dear child's beauty, her talents, her grace, her excellent breeding, plainly laying himself out to flatter the mother, who listened scarcely able to restrain tears of joy, while the father showed his delight by a gratified smile. The joy was contagious. Everybody shared in it. Even the children were obliged to stop playing so as not to disturb the conversation. The atmosphere was surcharged with awe. I heard the mother of the important little girl, touched to her profoundest depths, ask Julian Mastakovich in the choicest language of courtesy, whether he would honor them by coming to see them. I heard Julian Mastakovich accept the invitation with unfeigned enthusiasm. Then the guests scattered decorously to different parts of the room, and I heard them, with veneration in their tones, extol the businessman, the businessman's wife, the businessman's daughter, and, especially, Julian Mastakovich. Is he married? I asked out loud of an acquaintance of mine standing beside Julian Mastakovich. Julian Mastakovich gave me a venomous look. No, answered my acquaintance, profoundly shocked by my intentional indiscretion. Not long ago I passed the church of. I was struck by the concourse of people gathered there to witness a wedding. It was a dreary day. A drizzling rain was beginning to come down. I made my way through the throng into the church. The bridegroom was a round, well-fed, pot-bellied little man, very much dressed up. He ran and fussed about and gave orders and arranged things. Finally word was passed that the bride was coming. I pushed through the crowd, and I beheld a marvelous beauty whose first spring was scarcely commencing. But the beauty was pale and sad. She looked distracted. It seemed to me even that her eyes were red from recent weeping. The classic severity of every line of her face imparted a peculiar significance and solemnity to her beauty. But through that severity and solemnity, through the sadness, shone the innocence of a child. There was something inexpressibly naive, unsettled and young in her features, which, without words, seemed to plead for mercy. They said she was just sixteen years old. I looked at the bridegroom carefully. Suddenly I recognized Julian Mastakovich, whom I had not seen again in all those five years. Then I looked at the bride again, good God! I made my way, as quickly as I could, out of the church. I heard gossiping in the crowd about the bride's wealth about her dowry of five hundred thousand rubles so and so much for pocket money. Then his calculations were correct, I thought, as I pressed out into the street. The end. Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. 
Best regards.